I never told you that. We had a teacher, and he was a very nice teacher. And when they came in, the Hungarians came in, and they say he was a spy, and they shot him. And they led him in our river, and he was laying there for maybe two, three weeks in the river. And he was on blown up, and, and his parents came to pick him up, and they wouldn't let him. They didn't let the, the parents pick him up. They say, you see, this is what's going to happen to you if you have helped the Jewish people. So, 1939, the Hungarians came in. I remember a lot of the old Jewish people who know Hungary before the war, they thought they are the same Hungarians, but they weren't. They went all out with the colors of the Hungarian flag and everything. And those anti-Semites started screaming, what you happy about this? You don't know what's waiting off it for you. So, they just turned low profile and they went home, they wiped their nose, and they said they are not the same Hungarians anymore. So later on they started digging who belongs to, who came from uh, Poland, from Galicia, Jews, and they started deporting them. Of course they couldn't do it to us because we were way back Hungarians. But they started uh, looking for things, how to get away the business from us. So they said that Jewish people cannot serve liquor, they cannot sell wine and all that, only if they are uh, farmers, if they grow their wines. So that's how we lost our business already. The first, uh, the first of uh, September, when I saw there were coming uh, uh, airplanes, and all of a sudden bombs from the airplane. We didn't see the airplanes in the bomb, but we saw the little house completely upside down. The roof was on the on the ground, and when that was next next closer the next block, and my grandmother said. Come on, children, to the cellar. We had a cellar in the house. We went down into the cellar and we say, Shema Israel, I pray. And we stood there for a while until it quieted down. And we came back out and she said, now we know the war is, is for true. They always had a satisfaction to see us dehumanized, to see us that we fighting over a piece of bread, that we taking away the last crumb of bread from our children, or even in the camp, when they gave us, they were supposed to give us a slice of bread, they didn't give us the slice of bread, they gave us a whole little loaf from a pound, and we were supposed to divide it for ten, and very seldom you could measure with the centimeter or with the inch that every slice was just the same. And then the fight began too because one sometimes got a crumb more and the other one had less. And, and they were staying and laughing. They had, very, they was, had a, a lot of satisfaction in to see us fighting over that crumb of bread. We were captured around Warsaw. We were surrounded by, I mean, this is just a little story. We were surrounded in the forest by a field, and behind the field were a little village, were villages all around. And we were in the forest, and at night, we, three days before we didn't eat anything. We just, I think, had, we find somewhere a piece of onions, and we ate a small piece of onions. We didn't have anything to eat. And I was with a very good friend of mine who is still, who made the liberation with me, who survived at the same time. We went to the army, he's from Vilna, Harris Sanders. His name was Harris Sarnevich, but he, he shortened it for Sanders. And uh, we were uh, together and we couldn't see anybody, but we could hear all the time there were wounded, so many. 
and they were just a Jesus, a Jesus, a Maria, a Jesus, a Jesus. And, and, and we heard it all around, and they were crying, and they were going on. And then we were so hungry, so when they came out a little bit light, so we saw a tree about, I would say, maybe 20 feet, 20 feet from our forest. So Sandra says to me, let's go, we see little apples on the tree. Let's go and get the apples. So I say, okay. So we went to see the apples. Of course, the apple wasn't even to eat, but it still is better when you are hungry, when you didn't eat anything. But we, we heard, we had bullets right in front of us and behind us. Zoom, 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 zoom. And we got the apples and we came back to the forest. And my friend Harry says to me, says to me, you know, we are going to win the war yet because the Germans, they don't know how to, how to fight. They are not shooting right. If I would be there, I would already kill them. And the Germans finally came and they surrounded us. Hand ho, hand ho, this man, raise your hands. Certainly I was in the uniform, in the Polish uh, uniform. They surrounded us. Uh, for a little while I did escape and I was hiding and then I came back to them. But the point is that the German couldn't tell that I'm Jewish. They couldn't tell, they couldn't tell. For it. So when they went over, the Poles, they already heard it, then they are looking for Jews special. So they say, here is a Jew, here is a Jew. The Poles gave me away. So finally, they got me as a Jew. There is seven kilometers, the German border. That's why when the war started, the Germans was practically the same day or day after in my town. And when they came, there were hardly a few days when it, the law came out that all the Jews had to have a, a yellow band and a star. And they put the people to work. At the time, uh, we didn't notice that there was nothing bad against the Jews because I remember even this one, uh, the this, this soldier who was checking the tickets. He Tommy said, good boy, good boy. So, you know, you don't, you don't think anything like that. Did you know that this was going to be a war against the Jews? No, 100% no. no. Actually, my parents told me, as I remember, that in the First World War, they got along very good with, with the German people. And the reason why, because German and Yiddish is, is very is close. So they could understand what the German was talking about. So um, my, I remember my mother keep saying, said that the German people are nice people, smart people, and she was, uh, we, we never believed in our dreams that this would happen to the Jewish people. And um, maybe on, End of November, beginning of December, I don't know exactly, they, they came, the Polish policemen, two policemen came, and they gave us one hour time to, to move everything, whatever we can, in one hour. They were ordered it, by the Germans. They were ordered by the Germans, yeah. The Polish, they didn't do it on their own. They only took the orders from the German, and they gave it to us. So, you know, if, in one hour, you don't know what to take. My sister was running, my mother, she was hysterical, she didn't. She was putting one thing and then forgot, and then we had to put two pair pens, and we put some stuff but in, in the pillowcase. So we went to the station, and then we went to the train, and we went to Krakow. The motorcycles came first, and the, uh, the, t the tanks, and uh, uh, they right away wanted to scare the people, not just the Jews. Uh, when they went through the main street, they shot red, uh, right, whoever it was on the street was shot. Uh, the main ob objective was just how to start to degrade the Jews before they killed them. They had to degrade them, to uh, uh, turn into nothing. And then one day the Nazis summoned the Jewish population to the marketplace. They told us to assemble everybody out from the house, 
old people, sick people, children, everybody had to go uh, out to the market square. Uh, if not, they would be killed. Well, we came out the markets were square, and here we see a bonfire. All a bonfire made from all the Jewish prayer books from the synagogue. They 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 emptied out the synagogue, the Torah scrolls, the the books, everything what they found in the synagogues. There were three synagogues in the city from all the synagogue, and they put them on the bonfire. When we came to the city, they put a match, they started the bonfire. At the same time, we turned our heads. At the same minute, we saw all the three synagogues on fire. When the fire started, they ordered, they pushed the young girls to take the old men to dance. You should dance. Everybody around, we cried. And our neighbors were standing around all the people because you knew everybody, it's a small city. The non-Jews watched like, like a show and left and we cried. The feeling that time was so painful, looked at we are nothing. I, I remember I looked a dog past the street and I felt like, like this. I was a young girl and I felt, look, that, that dog is luckier than I am. I envied him. He, I saw he had a master. He was fed. We didn't have anybody to take our side. They were able to do with us what they wanted. So after the fire subsided, they told us to, to um, line up four by four and march through the whole city. It was the, the unhappiest, I think, well, next to, next to losing everybody, that was a very unhappy, uh, unhappy moment of my life. Well, my first memories of that, the beginning of the war, is when uh, everybody in the house that was there was very upset and crying and looking out the window. And as a, out of curiosity, I did too. And what there was happening that there was a very large Orthodox uh, temple across the street, and. Uh, uh, there, everybody was upset because the Germans were taking out all the prayer shawls and prayer books and putting them in a heap in front of the synagogue and uh, finally torched it and start, this, is, this is how I uh, remember the beginning of the war. Well, my mother was sitting there having to sew this star on and we were actually wearing it on the front and on the back. So if you went outside, you were forced to wear it. So whoever saw you in the street would know who you were, that you were Jewish. And so my sister in the stroller had to have a star of David on, this yellow star that in the middle said, Judah, Jew. And uh, so no matter if you were two and a half or if you were 80 years old, you had to wear it if you were outside. And this was the first time that you recognized that you were Jewish? I never thought of myself as anything other than who, you know, just a child. Uh, Jewish didn't mean that much. We were assimilated Jews. My parents were assimilated. They didn't look, you know, wear the outer garment that you would obviously know that they were Jewish. We looked like everyone else. Uh, you'll see in the pictures that looked like any other normal Polish children, except that we were Jewish. Now you were different. Very different. That's when uh, the difference began. That's when I felt uh, we were different. And being Jewish was uh, something that uh, caused grief and, uh, you know, just was part of the struggle 
that began when my father left. The three of us were left together, my sister, my mother, and I. And she received orders that she would have to vacate the premises because <clears throat> it was such a large building that the Germans would be taking over. And uh, she had a couple of hours that she had to clear out. But before she cleared out, she had to make sure that the linens on the beds were changed and the table was set for company. And she was only able to take two little suitcases with her of, to carry for my sister and I and herself. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible time for her. Uh, having to leave everything that she owned and not really knowing what would happen. I, I can't imagine the feelings that she had to go through. On one day, I, you know, I've been walking around and listened to different things, you know, I've been walking, and then the Germans, they had uh, picking up people, anybody, you know, the scene, and they picked me up, and they brought me to our dorm. When I, the, when I came there, they already had a few trucks waiting, and they loaded up and they brought them to Radom. So you were picked up off the street in off Warsaw? Off the street. And I couldn't even go back to say, you know, goodbye to my family. I haven't seen them to now. 